Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first webinar of the Hawaii Overdose Data to Action Peer-to-Peer -peer Project. Um, it's administered through the Hawaii Department of Health Adult Mental Health Division. Uh, my name is Tiana Quantanilla, and I will be your facilitator for today. I want to first start us off with a couple of housekeeping items. So this is a Zoom webinar format. So you can see us, but we are unable to see you. Um, we'll be broadcasting a couple of poll questions throughout the presentation, so please be on the lookout for those. You are free to use the chat feature to share your thoughts or concerns or comments, but if you have any questions for the panelists, we ask that you please add those to the question and answer box, um, and we'll do our best to go ahead and address them during the Q&A portion of our webinar. We want to make sure we respect everyone's time, so um, you know we're doing our best to keep this down to an hour, and that said, if we are unable to reach your question today, we will be providing contact information at the end in case you would like to contact or reach out to one of uh, the speakers. As you can see, this meeting is being recorded. So we plan to upload the recording to YouTube and then we will go ahead and share that URL with you um, along with the PDF copy of our slide decks in the next week. At this time, I want to introduce our project lead um, and our two guest panelists for today. Dr. Deborah Talangi is the principal investigator of this OD2A peer-to-peer -peer project here in Hawaii. And he also serves as a co-principal investigator for the State Plan Data Analytics Infrastructure Project. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, which is where he also received his master's degree in economics. He also received his bachelor's of commerce in economics and information systems from the University of the South Pacific. Next, we have Mary Beth Cox and she is the substance use epidemiology team lead within the North Carolina Division of Public Health. She leads a team of epidemiologists focused on statewide surveillance of alcohol, opioids, and other medication and drug use, and is the co-developer for the North Carolina Opioid and Substance Use Action Plan and Alcohol and Public Health Data Dashboards. She also serves on several state and national work groups aiming to reduce alcohol and other drug morbidity and mortality. Lastly, we have Michael Corey. He is the Director of Communications for Maryland's Opioid Operational Command Center, or OOCC. And in this role, he oversees the OOCC's quarterly reporting process, which involves maintaining Maryland's opioid data dashboard. Michael has been with the state of Maryland since January of 2020. And prior to this role, he served as a law enforcement intelligence analyst with the Colorado Information Analysis Center, where he focused on black market marijuana operations. Michael holds a master's in international relations, which he received from the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And with that, I will go ahead and pass the mic over to our speakers. Um, Dr. Tawangi, you have the floor. So thank you so much, Tiana, for the introductions. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're ple pleasantly surprised at the amount of interest this topic has generated, and hopefully we can use this opportunity to build on more collaborations around the subject in the future. So I went ahead and shared my screen. Um, so first, I will take a few minutes to go over some background information to provide some context to our talk today. Then Mary Beth will present for um, on the North Carolina dashboard and Tableau. Michael will present next on Maryland's dashboard and ArcGIS. And I will follow with Hawaii's dashboard and Power BI. We'll hopefully have about 10 minutes uh, at the end to answer some questions and maybe have a short discussion. Our objectives today are to walk you through real world use cases of dashboards developed on each platform for substance use disorders. Um, give you an overview and live walkthrough of each platform, as well as to highlight the importance of web design for improving data dashboards. Each of us will share brief history for each dashboard and then provide a live walkthrough, highlighting some things you might find useful for your own dashboards. We will then switch over to an overview and live walkthrough of each platform sharing some of the things we like and some of the things we think could be improved. Whether you are a seasoned dashboard developer that is curious about our experiences with other platforms, or you are thinking about developing a new dashboard for your state, 
for the very first time. We hope that you find some of what we shared today from our own experiences useful. So what is a data dashboard? Well, there are many definitions, but one that I personally like is this, a tool to organize and visualize data in a meaningful way. It's simple and concise and captures the key points of what a data dashboard is in our context. The minimal skill sets required for developing data dashboards falls into two categories. First are computer-based data skills required for manipula manipulating and or visualizing data. And second are domain-based skills required to organize this data into useful information, essentially subject matter knowledge. In most cases, these skills are specialized and separate, but in the health field, ep epidemiologists are trained in both. Platforms like Tableau, ArcGIS, and Power BI have come a long way and building interactive data dashboards is easier and more accessible than ever. I don't think there are hard and fast rules when it comes to making a good data dashboard, but I do think that any dashboard can be made more effective by improving the interface and user experience. Graphic or web design skills are really useful for this. However, even small, simple changes can have a pretty significant effect. And these are generally straightforward to learn and apply. I'll wrap up my short introduction with this high level overview of the platforms. ArcGIS was the first to be developed, but it really is an example of a specialized software that eventually incorporated tools that can be used to build dashboards. Whereas Tableau and Power BI were designed for this purpose from the outset. Now these pricing schedules are always changing but for individual licenses, ArcGIS is the most cost-effective, coming in at somewhere about $8 per month. However, I think you, um, the licenses are sold per year, so that will set you back $100 for one license to get started. Power BI is $10 per month for the pro version and $20 per month for the premium individual license. The difference being you get access to Microsoft's online AI framework with the premium version. If you or your organization are invested in Microsoft, Power BI does come bundled with some Microsoft 365 subscriptions, or it can be upgraded for sometimes less than the individual licenses. Tableau is $15 a month for individuals, but it also keeps a per user price for its two additional enterprise licenses at $42 and $70 per month. For enterprise solutions, Microsoft by far costs the most at $5,000 a month, but this is really targeted at large organizations who want a single integrated solutions for its entire workflow. ArcGIS starts at 500 per year for its base enterprise version, and the flagship enterprise version is priced at about $4,500 per year. In terms of popularity, most sources we looked at said Tableau is the market leader, and this is reflected in your answers from the sign-up sheet. Tableau use is at about 36%, and ArcGIS and Power BI uh, sort of tied at 19 and 17%. We also had responses for Excel, our flavored tools like Shiny, Qualtrics, and Green River. So now I'll pass it over to Mary Beth. Thanks, Dev. Are, are you all seeing my, no, not yet. <laughs> seeing my screen now? Okay, thank you. And everyone can hear me okay, great. So, um, hi everyone, Mary Beth Cox here from North Carolina Division of Public Health. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a substance use epidemiologist and um, though we have training in data visualization, we don't often have training in how to develop dashboards, like, or at least when I was going through school. So this was a new thing for me to learn. And I'm gonna take you through a little bit of the history of our overdose dashboard, um, which actually tracks the metrics that are outlined in our state's overdose action plan. So our plan, originally launched in June of 2017, and it was tracking 13 different metrics as a way to measure our impact on the overdose epidemic. And, uh, the plan since had two updates, kind of every other year we update the plan. And the most recent one happened this past summer and moved our plan from the opioid action plan to the opioid and substance use action plan to acknowledge the increasing involvement of other drugs in this epidemic like stimulants, benzodiazepines, et cetera. 
And um, one of the action items that was in the original plan was to build a data dashboard. And this was to make county level metrics available to partners across the state on a regular basis. And the work of building that dashboard fell to our team. So you're looking now at our original dashboard, which was built in our shiny. It was great, um, really customizable. We really never ran into something that we couldn't do on this platform. And it was fairly low cost. It was completely free at first while we were building. And then after we launched, uh, we were getting enough traffic that we had to start paying um, a fee for bandwidth and hosting the site. But the biggest downside, and it's a, a pretty big downside to um, using our Shiny was that it required a lot of programming knowledge. The overdose dashboard team um, mostly consists of myself and a colleague at um, UNC Chapel Hill, the Injury Prevention Research Center, Dr. Mike Dolan Fliss. A uh, huge shout out to Mike. He has um, got a really strong background in informatics and epidemiology. And um, as I mentioned, I'd never built a dashboard before. So I was really, really lucky, continue to be lucky to have Mike as a partner in this work. And so our shiny was great for building this dashboard. We could make it look like we wanted it to, but if Mike ever moves on and leaves us, then there's no one else on our team who could really keep this dashboard going. And around the time that the second uh, version of our action plan was being prepped, the uh, state DHHS purchased a Tableau server, both an internal and external server, and IT told us we had to migrate any existing dashboards onto our state server. So I really didn't have much of a choice in which program to use when it came to Tableau, but we have noticed a lot of benefits since moving from our Shiny to Tableau, that, and I'll just highlight a few today. Um, our new updated action plan had some different metrics, different data sources. It also started to track local actions at the county level. So Mike and I literally took to the, the drawing board, the whiteboard back when we could all be in person and sketched out a plan for what we wanted the new dashboard to look like. So you're seeing there like each of the pages as we were brainstorming in Tableau. And then we started to move to diagramming and lucid chart um, to kind of sketch out that process for how do we harmonize 10, 12 different data sources and across multiple counties, across multiple time points, what does that harmonization process look like to get it into a format that would be Tableau friendly? Uh, this is a list of all the pages that are currently in our Tableau. This is what um, Tableau calls a story, and I'll show that when we go to the live demo. But from conception to finish, I think it took us just under a year to launch this Tableau version of the dashboard. Um, that was a bit behind schedule because we were slowed down by um, three months of parental leave and then a global pandemic. So very proud of us for getting it up and running when we did. Um, and that was not all building. A lot of that is, um, as I mentioned, we had new data points. So it was building relationships with those data partners, reaching out and, and getting DUAs into place, um, learning new data and working it into kind of that workflow that I was showing on the previous slide. And since we launched about a year ago, um, we've added a couple new pages to the dashboard. And that's one of the things I really love about Tableau. It's really easy to kind of just insert a new page into this lineup of your story. So we've been doing that kind of along the way. It's always a, a work in progress. And I'm gonna attempt now to go live and demo the dashboard and then show you a little bit of the like under the hood behind the scenes stuff as well. So let me hope this works. Is everybody seeing now as I, I move to a different screen? Thank you. Um, so this is the, the dashboard, it's embedded in um, our DHHS site. And you'll notice that it doesn't kind of expand and take up your whole page like other websites do. And that was something we did on purpose. Tableau has the ability to do that. But I'll zoom out for a second here and just show you that we set all of the pages in this story to fit really nicely to one page of paper so that people could print these out and take it with them as kind of a custom made fact sheet for your county, it's ready to go. Our Shiny, we got a lot of feedback that it wasn't very printer friendly. So that was something we really wanted to do when we migrated to Tableau. I'm gonna zoom us back in and hope folks can see this. So we're looking now at the strategy page. This is like a summary of all the, um, the seven different strategies that are in our action plan. So you can toggle between those strategies here. Um, each strategy has two metrics. So we've got a graph and a map for each of the metrics. And those are more like outcome data health points. So this is death and ED data. And then also two local actions. Um, so what are counties doing? And this summary page just gives you an overview of all four of those data points. 
And then you can select from the place drop down. We've got all of our 100 counties here, also a bunch of different regional views of the data as well. And um, if you select a place, this whole page is going to update to now show you um, the, the county or regional data that you chose. A couple things I wanted to point out um, that I don't love about Tableau that show up on this page. Maps are not always um, the best. ArcGIS definitely does a better job of mapping. Um, for example, this death rate map, if you notice, we do have some counties with a zero death rate, but they get picked up in this gradient, this automatic gradient that Tableau develops. Um, and so if I were mapping in GIS, I would you know, have made that white or gray or put some hash marks through it, something to make it stand out and not make it get scooped up in the color scheme there. We have found some ways to kind of define those um, map buckets, but it's really complicated and just the juice wasn't worth the squeeze for us in this case. Um, overlaying different layers of a map is also really tricky to do in Tableau. Um, and the same sort of thing here, if you look at this graph, this is um, something that we do in a lot of our reports in Excel and it's year to date. So gray is the full year worth of data and then blue is in this case, January to June. And so you're building that year to date. And this is um, in Excel, not really complicated, but in Tableau, it proved to be really complicated to figure out how to have these two different bars on top of one another. So um, I was told that it would be much easier to do in R Shiny, but this was kind of like a, a fancy Tableau hack that we had to figure out. And then um, we've got a lot of pages I encourage folks to explore, but I just wanted to show um, two more things. This is the, oops, sorry, the metric page. So like our focus page on um, all 14 of those data points that we track. And if we select a location here again, so we've got rates over time um, for the county we selected compared to the state rate. And we got a lot of feedback from partners that graphs were really, like this were really intimidating and they didn't know how to kind of hone in on like what's the take home message. So this bit of text above the, um, the graph is actually what we've called live text. So if I select another place, it's updating now to a sentence on Alexander County and what was their rate. And so that's something we were able to kind of program on the back end and it does it automatically when you change the page um, instead of having to like write a sentence for all 100 counties and 30 regions or so that we have in the dashboard. Then uh, the last thing I wanted to show before I do a little bit of like behind the scenes is another thing that drives me nuts about Tableau. You cannot hyperlink in text. So this is our how to use page. We link to a bunch of things like our um, technical resource notes document with all those like uh, nerdy data point things that most people don't wanna read on a page. So we dumped them all in one document. Um, also our, you can download a raw data file if you wanna make your own visualizations. And so those things are all linked on this page. I would have wanted these bold words to be a link to those, but Tableau won't let you hyperlink. We have uh, put it on message boards for years, they haven't listened to us yet, um, but it's it's frustrating if you're in the tablet community. If someone knows a better workaround, please let me know. But what we've decided to do is put these icons and you can put a link in the icon. Um, and this is now taking you to our um, tech notes page. So always have come up with creative solutions, but it's kind of frustrating if you don't, if you can't think of a solution. Uh, so I also wanted to show just a quick glimpse, and I know I'm flying here. I'm trying to make sure we've got time for my colleagues, but um, this is the data file that you would download if you clicked that data link. And just like a quick note to people who are thinking about um, developing in Tableau, we have noticed through a lot of trial and error that Tableau prefers um, so if you a long form data set. So this goes on and on and on, row after row. Every place and time point has its own row for every metric versus um, wide form data where there, there's not very many columns here. So um, that's definitely something to think about as you're kind of setting up your data set for Tableau. Then just a quick peek at the user interface, user interface for Tableau. So this is Tableau desktop. If you like paid for that license, had it downloaded on your machine. It's in like the app that I open up just like Word or, or anything else, other program on my machine. And 
I mean, it can get really, really complicated, but at its base, it's really simple. I mentioned with R, Shiny having to like program everything. This is literally like, as long as you can connect your data, you get a list of all of your variables here. And then if I'm like, okay, I'm interested in date, this is like dummy data that comes preloaded and sales. And you just, you're literally dragging and dropping. And then there's like some hints over here and like, well, let me see it as a pie chart. Oh, that's not great. Let's look here. And you can just, you can flip them around and kind of sometimes even stumble with some dumb luck onto the best way to visualize your data. So um, really easy to make just basic visualizations. And um, let's see if I can get it up here at the top of my page. This is, um, I mentioned that we now work on the server. Uh, it looks like I've timed out, but hopefully you can see it in gray scale there. It looks very similar to the desktop version. So we haven't really lost any functionality developing in the server space. Um, I still have a desktop license, which allows me to post data files to the server for other people on our team to build off of, but the majority of our team now builds off of this server space. And then I'm just going to move back to our slides and wrap up here. This was just my in case uh, live version failed, but it's got some notes if people want to review uh, later on. So just to wrap up, Tableau is definitely not as customizable as our Shiny and maybe some of the other programs that you'll hear about today. But I, one of the things I love the most is how big the Tableau community is. There's always people on the forums who have run against the same problem, have a clever workaround. Um, and I also really love to use Tableau Public. This is a screen grab from um, yesterday. I just went to Tableau Public and typed in overdose dashboards and there are thousands and thousands of them. And you can flip through on Tableau Public and if you see a visualization that you really like and you want to learn how they did it, if it's posted to Tableau Public, you can download the workbook, which is what we were just looking at in the um, like Tableau desktop space. That's the workbook and it's the like, okay, what did they drag and drop? How, what did they select? And you can kind of work backwards to build that same visualization for your own dashboard, which was really, really handy when I was first learning. Um, we actually built an alcohol data dashboard on Tableau Public. Um, before we had a state server and then posted the link on our state website. Um, didn't really lose any functionality, worked great. Um, it's since been migrated to the server. I'll say the only thing that was really a sticking point is that if you're working in Tableau Public, which is free, um, you can't save to your desktop. So you have to post any change you make to the web. Um, there are some ways you can hide, like if you don't want a draft to be super visible, you can kind of mask it, but um, not always ideal if you want to be like emailing files or saving it for backup purposes. And just to sum up some next steps um, for the North Carolina dashboard, we're expanding our equity page to include county level demographics and build in some new um, equity focused actions and metrics. We've just completed um, our annual survey of local health departments to get up updated action data. And we'll be loading that into the dashboard. And then we're working with our prevention team to develop a formal evaluation of the dashboard and really hope that that'll inform our next iteration of the dashboard. Um, my email is going to be on the last slide of this presentation. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions we're not able to answer today. I am really uh, love talking about this body of work and happy to share what we've learned with other folks. So thanks very much. I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Michael now. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt just for a second here. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, awesome presentation. Uh, we are going to be broadcasting the first poll question, so please be on the lookout. We'll take a few moments to let you guys respond. But I just wanted to let you all know, the audience and first know to look out for that. Thanks, Kim. Okay, I will pass. All righty, uh, thank you, Tiana. Um, and thank you to the whole um, Hawaii um, OD2A team for inviting me to talk to you today. Uh, hold on, let me uh, share my screen. Yeah. Hopefully I share the right thing here. Give me just one second. Okay, hopefully you can all see uh, what I'm seeing. Uh, it should be the slides. So um, my name is Michael Corey. I am the Director of Communications for Maryland's Opioid Operational Command Center. Um, the OOCC is Maryland's um, like primary interagency coordinating body for the state's uh, response to the opioid crisis. 
Um, and we work with all state agencies and local, um, local agencies who are responding uh, to the opioid crisis in one way or another, you know, implementing programs targeting uh, opioid related uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, so we get everybody, we try to get everybody working on the same page. Um, similar to Mary Beth's um, organization, we also uh, work to set the state's uh, strategy, um, the opioid crisis response strategy through our interagency opioid coordination plan, which we update um, every year. So kind of a similar function there. Um, and we initially set out to create our dashboard um, a couple years ago uh, at this point. Um, with the purpose of having a visual representation of um, our quarterly reporting process. Um, up until now, the OCC has released a quarterly report with um, sort of preliminary, um, like, a, a, well, like sort of a surveillance document so that uh, we can get uh, information about the latest uh, trends in overdose related uh, data out to the public. Um, so our dashboard is basically a visual representation of the information that you'll find in our report uh, with the benefit of not having the general public uh, needing to read, say, like a 20 or 30 page document. So we really want to get the information out to people in a way that is uh, user friendly and easy to digest. Uh, the current iteration of our dashboard, uh, we got our uh, inspiration from the Maryland's uh, uh, coronavirus dashboard. You can see the link to it there. Um, but it was also built uh, using ArcGIS and kind of showed us like sort of what the art of the possible was with this platform. Um, it is a very impressive uh, dashboard, um, especially like the behind the scenes uh, automatic data feeds that go into it. And um, our dashboard, as you'll see in a moment, is not as complex, uh, but it doesn't need to be. Um, so again, we wanted to create something that was simple. Um, simple to use, simple to update, and that's kind of where we landed. Um, you'll see a image of it here. Actually, let me, um, I will drop a link in the chat so you guys, if you want, you can follow along. Uh, that's just a screenshot here of what it looks like. Um, right, so why did we choose ArcGIS? Uh, well, it is easy to use, um, and it presents data in a way that is easily digestible. Um, and that, um, as I'll get into when I do the live demo, is kind of one of the drawbacks too, which is does have sort of a limited uh, amount of functionality. You know, as Dev was talking about um, in the beginning, it really is uh, a mapping platform first and foremost that, you know, added uh, dashboard capabilities later on. Um, and they're usable and customizable enough that I can make it look nice, I think, um, and share it, uh, you know, get the information out that we need. Uh, but it does have its limitations, and I'll, I'll get into that in the live demo. Um, the plus is mapping is that, you know, ArcGIS Online is fairly good at mapping. ArcGIS Pro Desktop, very good at mapping. Um, and for the mapping savvy, I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with what it can and can't do. Um, I, like Mary Beth, I am also, uh, this is my first time building a dashboard. I'm not a data scientist or um, trained in GIS, so very much a layman. Um, but that's where our, the ArcGIS platform uh, came in really handy. Um, it is easy to use after an initial learning curve, uh, which was a little steep for me, I must say, but we did get a lot of help from our uh, partners at the Maryland Department of Planning who uh, built out our first concept of the dashboard and what it could look like on ArcGIS. But it was very easy for them just to build that concept and then hand it to us and let us sort of take it and run with it. Um, and I'll kind of show you that in just a second too. Um, it is scalable uh, within, let me just go back to the picture. So this this format is set to fit um, just one screen, but if we wanted to, we can keep adding things in the way we can lay out our pages. We, you know, we can keep uh, adding elements down further on, we can stack them um, and keep adding things in or customizing it as we go. And another benefit is that it uh, is supported by uh, DOIS, the Depart Maryland Department of IT. Um, and it was free for us to use through the state's uh, enterprise license. So all those factors sort of made it the most attractive option for us. We did look at uh, Power BI, um, didn't have the funds uh, available um, at the top um, to do that. Uh, we looked at um, a few other platforms. One in particular that was free um, was Socrata, 
Um, and Socrata has some dashboard capabilities. There's a lot of customizable features, uh, but it, uh, ArcGIS went out for us because of what we could do with the mapping. So uh, tell you what, I will come back to this next steps part um, at the end and we can just dive into the um, dashboard preview. Um, and I hope you can see me changing screens. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is our website. Um, right now, unfortunately, the dashboard is not embedded. So this link takes you to the dashboard and I'll show you the front end first and then I'll show you the back end. Um, it's fairly simple. I'll just give it a second here to load. Um, simple bar charts, nothing too overwhelming. So this is, you know, showing you this is uh, the opioid crisis uh, over time in Maryland. You can see the number of opioid-related uh, overdose deaths steadily climbing. Uh, there is a teeny tiny amount of interactivity, so you get this pop-up with the data showing you the data that's already there. Uh, that gets to one of the limitations. Um, just show you two interactive features real quick. So this this chart, um, I think this is my favorite interactive feature. So this is um, all substances, individual substances over that same time frame, but you can kind of customize it a little bit. So you can take out, you know, whichever substance you want to track. And in this case, I'm just choosing fentanyl, heroin, and prescription opioids. But here you kind of see, at least in Maryland, uh, the story of the opioid crisis over time, which is steady increase uh, in heroin or all opioids. And then fentanyl just, bam, arrives on the scene. And uh, I sure, I'm sure many of the people on the call are familiar with this story. Um, yeah, so that's an interactive feature there. Uh, we have overdose deaths. We have um, non-fatal emergency part department visits. Uh, and we also have EMS naloxone uh, administration data here. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'll just show you uh, one of our maps real quick. So I will choose uh, Howard County, why not? So. This uh, is the, you know, the more powerful part of uh, ArcGIS online. And this, again, I'm a layman, so this is fairly simple for someone who might be more familiar with mapping, but, you know, it has a few data layers, um, which I'll show you um, the back end of, but here you click, you have a region, you have the number of deaths last or uh, in a previous year, so 2020, number of deaths last year, number difference, percent change. Um, then you also have a mortality rate. Uh, so a few different layers uh, of data that you can see there. Um, it's still fairly straightforward, easy to use. All you have to do is drag, drop, click. When we figured that was easy enough for the general public to um, understand. Um, and you also have, um, yeah, this is a, just a different map showing opioid-related mortality. You know, looking at a different, uh, different way to look at overdose death rates, uh, taking into account uh, population. So why don't I move on then and just show you a few of the backup. So the dashboard, as you see it, is actually three different components. So for the 19% of you who use ArcGIS, uh, you may be familiar that this is actually an ArcGIS Experience Builder. And we chose this because it was the only way we could do, um, well, I'm sure there's other ways, but it, it was an easy way to incorporate multiple dashboards into one. So we have two dashboards really. We have a one for formatted for a larger screen and one formatted for mobile. And the experience builder will automatically recognize what screen size the user has and route them to whichever uh, version of the dashboard that they want to view. So this is, uh, I thought I had the experience builder. Anyway, uh, I think this is the experience builder. I'll just show you it just in case you're interested in seeing it for our, uh, never mind. Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. Edit. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so this is the back end of experience builder. I, I won't get into the, too much of it because I honestly don't understand too much of it. I watched a video on how to do this. Um, and it was straightforward enough. And uh, that's a good thing. A, a pro of ArcGIS is the community uh, is, is fairly strong too. It's long established. Um, Esri, the company who uh, makes ArcGIS uh, has a pretty uh, robust like online help forum. Uh, there's also a lot of users uh, out there, user forums and a lot of 
uh, how-to videos on YouTube. So I'll just show you here. You can kind of toggle between uh, see our, our mobile version here. Um, you know, same same information, uh, just laid out in a little bit of a in a different way. So you kind of just have to toggle through the elements and in the different ways. So uh, moving on, let me let's look at the back end of the desktop dashboard real quick. Um, just to show you like how you could customize it. Um, you can kind of add any sort of the elements, drag and drop them around. Um, I'll just show you one of the charts so you can kind of see because they're a little bit more difficult to deal with. Um, like Mary Beth was talking about, the, a lot of this is trial and error um, and really the way you format the data before you upload it. So you, you have to make sure that you're putting the data in a particular way that it, ArcGIS is gonna look at it, understand what you want it to do. And that, that could take some trial and error as well. Uh, but nothing that like uh, you couldn't figure out on your own just by, just by trying a few things. Um, you have some customizability. Uh, you can change font sizes. You can kind of change some of the way these uh, uh, data points are laid out. The thing that I don't like is what you can't do is you can't really change the data that's in that pop-up that you see. So that's a little bit of a drawback. So it's simple but it needs what we need to do. Um, and then I'll just wrap up here by showing you the map. Because again, that's kind of where we, uh, kind of where we landed on it. So uh, this is the map on the back end. There's a few different uh, layers here. Um, and I will just point out for the GIS savvy uh, among you, uh, ArcGIS Online is much more limited than ArcGIS Pro uh, naturally. Um, and one of the biggest challenges, um, it's silly, uh, but was getting uh, two labels uh, on one county. Um, it, ArcGIS Online just usually likes one label per you know, geographic unit. So it took some finagling and so, uh, some online searching, but basically, uh, and I'm sorry if this is unfamiliar for some of you, but it took uh, finding a centroid and having two different layers uh, on the same map to show two different labels. And it took a heck of a lot of finagling and font sizing because it actually really doesn't like having you having like two labels on one on one thing. So that was more difficult uh, to figure out. Um, I'll leave the back end of it there and just go back to our presentation. Uh, and wrap up here for the sake of time. More than happy to answer any questions at the end. So um, moving forward, what we want uh, to work on is optimizing the mobile version, uh, making it look as good as it can be. Um, next, we want to embed it on the website. Uh, similar to like what Mary Beth was talking about, like we don't want it to take up the whole screen. We don't want people uh, to have to go to a different site we want it to feel like it's an in, in, like, you know, integrated experience for the users. So they're not taken out of it or, you know, we want it just to be a little bit more seamless. So we're gonna work on that as we go forward. Uh, we're gonna work on adding uh, additional information as we go. So some of the information that you'll see in our report that is not currently in our dashboard is information about uh, say like uh, demographics. So age, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, um, so we want to start looking at those back, um, factors as well. Uh, we want to start uh, adding in information from our uh, SUD program inventory, which is very similar to uh, what Mary Beth was talking about, looking at uh, different factors, at, uh, different programs that are being implemented at the county level and you know, looking at progress over time and hopefully identifying where there's gaps or where you know, areas where uh, counties are doing particularly well. Um, and then we want to start uh, adding in information from other agencies. So for example, um, one thing that we talked about, and I know that our the Maryland OD2A team is looking at this, which is um, how to build a, a dashboard to get uh, some of the uh, data from the PDMP program uh, in a public, publicly accessible forum. Um, and then once we get all those things in place, we're looking at updating it a little bit more frequently. So right now we're updating it every quarter using data that is um, about 60 days old. Uh, we're sussing out the possibility of doing monthly updates, but then, 
you know, so we'd be getting information out there sooner, but we'll probably increase the lag time because I know a lot of the people on this call are probably familiar with the challenges of reporting out um, any sort of overdose related data and the preliminary nature of, of doing so and how much it can change um, and how unreliable it can be if you do it too soon. We definitely don't want to put misinformation out there. So we're going to we're looking at ways we can make the dashboard a little bit more informative um, as we go forward. But um, I will leave it there for now. And stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Michael. Um, we'll hand it off now to um, Dr. Tawani. Uh, thank you, Tiana and Michael. Uh, hopefully you guys can see the screen. So um, before I jump into the live walkthrough, I want to quickly go over some development timeline for the dashboard. So this version that I'm about to show uh, is actually the second iteration of our dashboard. Um, so the first version was developed in the summer of 2020 in response to a request from the Hawaii Department of Health. It was a fairly short turnaround of about three weeks. And given that we were most familiar with R, we decided to export the graphs into HTML and use those on the website. Initially, you know, the website was, uh, the framework was custom coded. And as you can imagine, it wasn't the greatest website in the world given three weeks. But many of the design considerations for this 2.0 version were made with the experiences that we got from that first version. So I really started pulling together the structure of the 2.0 version uh, in December of 2020. Again, the web framework, the web framework was, was custom. And this time we decided on using Power BI for the individual data dashboards. And I'll expand on the reasons why uh, in a little bit. So I'll move over to our dashboard, uh, which um, maybe Tiana can, can uh, post it in the chat, uh, the web address, so you guys can follow along if you like. So this is the landing page um, for, uh, let me just try and reload it again. This is the landing page for the dashboard. Um, and it's also the overview section as we call it. Uh, one of the things we really took away from the first website was a need to provide a more user-friendly experience in order to keep our visitors engaged. We wanted to ease users in, if you will, rather than potentially getting overwhelmed with graphs and numbers as soon as you open the website. That was some of the feedback that we got. Um, and so a lot of emphasis was placed on aesthetics and interactive features, uh, which really sets the tone for the rest of the website. Functionally, this section is intended to give our users a high level view of the situation in Hawaii using a couple of key uh, numbers. There's a main navigation here on the left uh, to each of the main sections of the website and the big interactive map of Hawaii, as well as these cards on the bottom. There's also a secondary navigation on the top, which takes you directly to uh, the individual dashboard section. Uh, finally, on this page is a recent addition, uh, is this short pop-up video to guide to our website, uh, which is narrated by our facilitator, Tiana. So you can watch that video so you can watch that video um, if you want a concise recap of my walkthrough here. One thing I think that sets apart um, our dashboard, our website, is we have tried to include substance use, mental health, and homelessness data, uh, which are closely related, all on the same website. This was part of the original request from Hawaii DOH, and this really reflects the overall approach that the DOH takes regarding behavioral health uh, in our state. Finally, since I've received questions about this before, this entire website was custom coded and everything was produced in house. All these icons, these backgrounds, these videos, the map. Uh, this was, of course, a lot of extra effort for our team, but we feel that it, it did pay off in the end in terms of what we currently have right now. So moving on, next we have the current trend section, uh, which is intended to provide a medium low view of behavioral health in Hawaii. This section also highlights a few graphs which are updated periodically um, or have data that is new to the website as well as displaying any data related to important current events. Case in point, uh, we have this um, COVID-19 curve for the state, which is updated daily. 
automatically. Um, and there's also um, these CARES calls. So these are the substance use and uh, mental health disorder line calls. Uh, we also have uh, vital statistics and uh, homelessness data as well on this section. Moving on, we have our uh, dashboard section. So this section has the most detailed breakdown of the data on the website. Currently for the substance use section, uh, substance use page, we have National Survey for Drug Use and Health data. Um, we also have hospitalization inpatient discharge data. This is historical from HCUP. Oops, sorry. Uh, we have the Hawaii CARES calls data, uh, prescription drug monitoring, as well as the vital statistics. We also included this one dashboard, um, which looks at co-occurring. It's not data, uh, it's not organized by data set so much. It's basically, you know, any, any statistics that, uh, that uh, involve both substance use and mental health that was um, one of the asks or one of the feedback that we got after we launched the website. Moving on to the mental health dashboard, similarly, um, it's organized by data set. First, we have, you know, for this data set, we have La Lima data, which is basically more recent hospitalization data. Uh, again, we also have um, historical inpatient discharges. We also have mental health emergency worker calls, Hawaii Cares calls, um, NASDA data, and I think it's the same. It is the same dashboard, but we decided to, to highlight something slightly different, this tab right here. Finally, we have homelessness data. We only have three data sets. Um, data for homelessness is kind of limited. Uh, the federal data source kind of has something for the entire state. Partners in Care is really limited to Oahu, uh, and then bridging the gap data is for all the other islands. Okay, so um, let's see where we are. We have a dashboard guide right here. Um, if you're curious about, um, you know, where the data sources came from, um, you can go check that out. And then before I move on, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, a format that we took for the dashboard. I encourage you guys to take a look at the dashboard. It's a little bit too much to go into all of them. But the general format that we use was we wanted to kind of keep everything kind of consistent and, um, for all the, the data sets, we chose two main graphs and these cards right here to highlight some key points. And then on the left here, we have our main navigation panel. So the navigation panel will change, uh, has different uh, options depending on the data set. And it was kind of challenging. Uh, we came up with this format because you know some of the data sets that we have, uh, they're record level data and some are summary level data, very different. Um, and trying to organize it in sort of a way that doesn't um, that makes it look like, like it's it belongs in the same page. It was kind of difficult, so that's where that's how we came up with this this one format. Um, and uh, let's see. Finally, moving on to the about section. Uh, this section talks a little bit about you know, background information for the website, uh, and then at the bottom we have a couple of tools that. You know, we highlight a couple of tools that we use to build a dashboard. Uh, for future plans, I think for the website, uh, we are of course adding more data sets. We have a couple uh, in line waiting for approval. You know, data governance pr uh, process, as uh, Mary Beth and Michael noted, is, is kind of difficult. Um, so we have data sets that are ready to go on, but you just haven't got approval yet. Um, we also want to improve the mobile version, the interactive mobile version. We do have a mobile version. Um, hopefully I can show it here. So if you go here, um, you might be able to see it. It kind of looks like this. It's not great. Um, it's, it's rendered slightly different on your phones, but, um, we had to, to cut back on the features because we just couldn't fit a lot of the stuff that we could fit on the desktop version. Another thing that we had to do also was we had to make individual uh, 
dashboards in Power BI and load those. So when your, you know, your computer loads and the phone loads, it recognizes it as a smaller screen, it'll load this alternate dashboard. Um, but again, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, it, it doesn't look as, as refined as uh, this desktop version. Um, some other things we wanted to add are videos, uh, infographics. And before I move on to uh, the next section, um, I wanted to point out this video uh, that we just uploaded yesterday, actually, um, onto our YouTube channel. It basically is talking about how we built the Power BI, this Nuzza dashboard using Power BI. And it's a, a short video, but it covers the basics and also touches on some of the, the advanced features. So, um, you know, the, those are some of the plans. We plan to put out some more videos. Hopefully they'll be informative and uh, we're hoping that that will support also some of future webinars. Okay, so let's move on now to the Power BI. So I will move back to the slides. So, before we do the walkthrough, um, I'll just mention a little bit about uh, our experiences with uh, trying out all these other dashboards. Uh, we tried out Tableau, ArcGIS, ArcShiny prior to Power BI 4. For, um, we had a Huawei COVID-19 dashboard. The Tableau backend interface wasn't as flexible, uh, we found as Power BI. ArcGIS was good. Uh, we didn't really see room for growth. They were both great. They are both great software. Don't get me wrong. It's just, you know, for our needs, uh, we have a team of students usually um, since we're at the university and they work part time and we're usually teaching them how to use all of this at the same time. So we needed something that was kind of um, easy to learn, had a good learning curve, um, but we could also grow with, with some of our more advanced, um, advanced students or advanced uh, employees. So Power BI we found was a good compromise. Right at the outset, we took out Shiny. We couldn't even use our Shiny or Flex Dash because you needed uh, to know R, right? Um, Power BI was a good compromise, as I mentioned, great interface, uh, not too difficult to scale to a large team and had a rich feature set. Um, one of the biggest things I'll say is UH had an existing enterprise license in the current user base. Uh, we piggyback, piggybacked off that. Uh, we used our license for all of the, the uh, dashboards that you see on the on the website and it is very, very expensive, but it helps out a lot. Uh, we can use as a team, there's two or three of us that go online and actually upload dashboards. Um, building the dashboards is done at the desktop level by individuals. You don't really need a license for that. Uh, I'll be honest, you can have students do that. Um, uh, without a license, you just use a trial license um, and then you deploy it using your actual um, enterprise license or a pro license. Uh, so I'll quickly go over, I know we are running out of time. Uh, I'll quickly go over to the desktop version, hopefully get to the to the online version. Basically, if you watch the video uh, that I showed earlier, um, uh, Sarah goes over a lot of what I'm about to go over. But basically, you have your report view here. Um, you have your table view here. You can do a little bit of, um, uh, you can change some stuff for the, the tables, but not a lot. And then you have this other view, which is a little bit confusing, but essentially if you have multiple tables you want to link together, you can use this. Um, and so I don't, you don't really need to do this. If you're just starting out, you can have one or two tables that are independent of each other. And so one of the things, as I mentioned before, is flexibility, right? Moving stuff around, copy pasting stuff is super easy, um, what I found. And then you have a lot of visualization tools. There's more than we've ever tried out. I'll just put it that way. There are limitations though, for example, um, for the cards that came with Power BI, we didn't really use those. We wanted something more flexible and we did find this, uh, call it an aftermarket you know, um, marketplace for, for these visuals. Uh, just like Tableau and, and RGS, there's a huge uh, support network, basically. People who 
who post, you know, leaders online, and we learned a lot from there. You have your tables here, you can drag drop, and then the formatting options. I'll say that the formatting options are, are amazing. There's so many things that you can do um, for each of these visuals. And before we move on, you know, I just like to point out one tip that um, I think was super useful for us to get like really clean looking uh, visuals. Uh, I think this applies to all of the other, well, I'm not sure if we can do it in the other software, but um, positioning and sizing stuff, you know, using your mouse is really hard. Uh, we usually use all these positioning um, to type in all of the locations. And if you're going to do, you know, I, I suggest picking a sort of consistent format that you can apply to all your, your, your um, um, elements on the page and just applying that to the rest of your uh, website in a consistent manner. That really gives the website a kind of looks like a consistent feel. Um, and I'm really running out of time here. I will quickly point out, uh, I will quickly point out the online version. Um, again, you need to deploy you need to go here to deploy any dashboards. Um, for example, I will pick NUSDA, the same dashboard, and you go here and um, you publish to web. And so you file embed report, and then there's two options, public to web, public, and website portal. This is where the limitations really come in that we found a lot of the features that you can use a website or portal like mapping ArcGIS is an ArcGIS extension that uses the great maps, of course, from ArcGIS. It's not available when you publish the web. Um, I don't know why. Another thing is if you try to download data uh, from the visuals, I know that um, Tableau allows this. You can't do it with um, Power BI. They've disabled these features in the publish the web, but they've allowed it in, in the portal, so the private version. I think this has something to do with security businesses in the past accidentally published all of the data to the web using that feature. So that might be why I'm not quite sure. So um, I will stop there because we are already at time. I'm really sorry. Um, okay, so I'll pass it back to uh, Tiana. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm so sorry that we were short on time here, uh, but I want to thank everyone for joining us as we wrap up and thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, by now, we'll actually maybe in a couple of minutes, we'll be receiving an evaluation via email. So we'd really appreciate it if you took a few minutes to just complete this and your responses will ultimately help us tailor our future webinars. Um, so this is the first in its series and we want to make sure that these webinars are useful for you. So before you hop off, Ooh, uh, sorry, folks. Sorry. Quick one. We have like just thirty seconds. There's one question in um in the Q and A box. Oh, sure. About feedback. Like, how do you get feedback? Like, who's using your dashboards? How do you know who's using them? And just like quick one. Like, and what what do they ask you to? Perfect. Like, Thank you. Yep. Yeah, to send. Okay. I'll just jump in really quickly and say that we, every time we launch a new version, we kind of do like a road show and would go around like every local coalition that would have us and um, lots of webinars like these and just showcase it and then leave like half of the time for questions and like what what's there that doesn't make sense to you and what's there that's or what's not there what's missing and we've made a lot of improvements just from going out and talking to people that we we know are using it. Yeah, I'll just add we we do something similar. You know, every time we work uh, or talking to, with our local partners, you know, uh, we, you know, we've shared it with them and just asked, you know, what information do you want to see? What information would be helpful? Um, we created a. I'm sorry, there's a bird clock in my house that's going off right now. It's not great. Uh, we we created a Google form that people could submit feedback. So we showed it to our ODU two A folks and a bunch of different work groups and just you know continuing to listen to what people um, people want to see. I'll echo the same thing. We usually get feedback from um, the Department of Health. We send them. Um, we have regular meetings. We also get feedback from the community. Um, yeah. 
All right, awesome, everyone. Thank you, Trina, for my, about that question. Um, so uh, I, I believe momentarily, you know, before you hop off, we have another, just this last poll question. Uh, like I said, we wanna make these webinars useful for you. Um, so just take a moment here and go ahead and indicate what topic you would like to learn more about in this poll. Um, and we will do our best to try to incorporate the more popular topics into our series. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact any one of our speakers. Uh, we can maybe put up the emails here as folks are, are leaving the webinar. Um, we'll leave that up here for you to record. Um, but with that, mahalo everyone for joining us again today, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.